in the mining space, we're going to break into a three-dimensional um, carbon cost curve. Obviously, in addition to um, you know to the money, we we'll like to be able to support our clients with things like environmental and social issues. We're all ready to deploy money and do deals in this environment. We have capital to, de to deploy and we want to actually get that money into mining companies' hands. Welcome viewers to this virtual discussion for one-to-one -one mining investment Africa, where we'll be gaining some insight on how mine finance, streaming and royalties providers maintain an edge during this bullish period for metals and mining. Introducing the panel speakers, it's my pleasure to welcome Julian Traeger, CEO of Anglo Pacific, John Dorian, Investment Manager at Orion Resource Partners, Yellen Roland Yomego, Senior Investment Officer at IFC, Caroline Donnelly, Managing Partner at Sprott Resource Streaming and Royalty, and Charles Bond, who's partner at Gowling WLG, will be leading this discussion. So Charles, I'll hand over to you to take it forward from here. Thanks. Thanks, Adam, and thanks to our four speakers as well today for sharing their time. We're uh, crossing various time zones today, so uh, really appreciate you all joining us from the various corners of the world. I think what I'm going to start by doing, just so the one-to-one -one viewers can uh, get an idea, is asking each of the speakers a little bit about the mine finance that they're involved in um, and that their companies represent, so you can have an understanding of where they're coming from on the mine financing uh, environment. So briefly, we'll go around them one by one. I'm just gonna follow my screen if that's all right. So Roland, you're, you're up first. If you could just give us a brief overview of the type of finance that the IFC provides to, to miners. Yeah, no, thanks, okay. um, Charles. And can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks very much indeed for uh, the introduction, uh, Adam. Um, as Adam noted, I work for the International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. I am based out of uh, Washington, D.C. I work in the mining, uh, the mining team. So the bulk of our financing is essentially uh, your traditional uh, project finance. Uh, we do do uh, equity uh, investments uh, as well. Uh, and uh, more recently, you know, some of the green loans or green bonds or what we call SDG. Uh, linked uh, type loans. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And we'll come back to that topic a bit later, I think. Um, Caroline, can I move to you next, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Charles. Uh, I'm, my name is Caroline Donnelly. I'm with Sprott Resource Streaming and Royalty. Uh, we're a relatively new entrant in the space, having been in existence for the past year. Um, we're in Sprott's private uh, private business in that we raise funds from institutional investors uh, to deploy into the, into the mining sector with our focus being streams and royalties as the name implies. And we're looking across commodities, so not just gold. You know, we'll look at base metal, speciality metals, um, the bulks as well, and across, across countries and jurisdictions. So no major restrictions as to where we can or can't go. Um, really looking to deploy capital into businesses that require capital for expansions, developments, moving the project forward, you know, whatever the need might be, um, certainly looking to help those companies grow with our funding. Excellent. Thank you. Um, John, I'm going to move on to you and Orion next, please. Yeah, hi. Um, so, look, Orion Resource Partners uh, is, is, I think we, we'd say, one of the largest uh, dedicated mining PE funds globally. Um, we, we operate across the world in, and we look for investments in equity, mezzanine, streaming and debt. Um, and that's across the spectrum from, from project finance to, to acquisition finance and all the way through to direct private equity and, and buyouts. Um, we operate across base, precious and the wider mineral space. Um, and I'd probably say our, our niche uh, is, is trying to solve large single ticket financings. We've, we've had some success uh, on that front. And, and I'd say that's probably where we, are, where we do our best work. Thanks, John. Um, and last but definitely not least, Julian from Anglo-Pacific. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Charles. So um, I am um, CEO of Anglo-Pacific, which is also in the royalty streaming space, uh, very much as uh, Caroline 
described. I think the difference is we're a public company. Uh, we're the only really um, listed uh, royalty company of size that's based in the UK and listed on the London Stock Exchange as our primary listing. We have a listing as well in Toronto. And we specialize not in the gold and silver precious space, but in non-precious, which we think is a much less competitive area. Um, and, uh, and transitioning from a sort of bulk materials heritage into more of a specialty 21st century uh, materials um, future. So that's a business in transition. Excellent. Well, well, thanks all for that. It's, um, it always amazes me that the types and range of different types of finance there are now available to mining companies. And we've moved a long way, I think, in the last 10 years. Um, the first kind of topic of conversation we wanted to touch on, because it is so topical, and I know you will all have different views on this, um, is the ESG environment that we now find ourselves in environmental, social and governance constraints that are now mining companies are finding themselves subject to. Uh, it seems that nowadays, you know, doing good means your, your share is going to perform well and that you may be able to raise more finance. But I'm sure that comes at a uh, cost in, in relation to due diligence and making sure you're applying all the right types of uh, principles and policies. What I wanted to ask each of you is, is, you know, what the ESG environment has meant you are now looking for in mining companies. What do they, what lists do they have to um, tick? Um, on what uh, examples do they have to show you that they are compliant with ESG principles you apply? And maybe I should start here because I know the IFC have always been kind of um, one of the, the initial starters around around this Roland with with the IFC and what sort of principles you will apply to mining investments no thanks uh, very much indeed uh, Charles um, as you noted I think uh, environmental and social um, standards have always been front and center uh, for the IFC uh, and you know more and more banks frankly um, including commercial banks, uh, have adopted uh, those uh, performance standards or what they would refer to as the uh, equator uh, principles. Um, I think, you know, mining companies will, will tell you that uh, one of the biggest risks that they are, um, you know, typically faced with, uh, it's not financial or technical. It's essentially um, having uh, a social license to operate and sharing uh, that uh, you know, communities that are living within uh, uh, the project uh, food, footprint are happy uh, and, and supportive, and that all stakeholders uh, uh, feel like there is a, a fair and, and equitable sharing of, uh, of project benefits. So uh, you know, I think um, as you as you noted, Charles, even you know, to be able to to raise financing today, a lot of uh, uh, investors are looking to mining companies to ensure that they are, uh, in essence, good, good citizens. And that it's, uh, it's, it's core in terms of what, how IFC, uh, IFC operates. Uh, but to answer your question, look, it depends. If we, you know, just keeping our audience in, in, in mind, junior mining companies, depending on at what stage of development uh, the project is, um, you know, we will look for uh, certain, standards, certain standards to, um, uh, to, be, to be met. As you know, we have eight standards. Uh, not all of them get triggered in any uh, given uh, project. You know, it could be in more in more advanced project. You know, at uh, development stage, we've seen anything from uh, resettlement, what we refer to as performance standard number five, or biodiversity uh, number six, cultural heritage, etc. Uh, but I think in the earlier stage, where, for example, there hasn't been a full uh, ESI and environmental and social impact uh, assessment. Uh, done, which we like to come in early and work with uh, our potential clients to ensure that, you know, whatever project they are um, looking to build uh, is essentially done in line with, uh, with our performance standards. So, um, you know, to, um, without getting to too, many, too much details, depending on the level of development, the stage of development of the project, a number of performance standards will get triggered. 
and we try and advise our clients so that when they get to a point whereby they are ready uh, to raise debt financing, uh, you know, computing ESIA, that they, they are positioned uh, to, to, be, to be successful. Uh, I'll stop there and maybe we can get into details uh, later on. Yeah, okay, that, that's very helpful. I'm gonna pass this on. Um, maybe, Julian, it'd be interesting to know from, from your point of view, I guess the IFC maybe starts a little bit earlier with some of these juniors when the, the royalty and streaming may be, but you can tell me if I'm wrong, comes in maybe a little bit later. What, uh, what do you expect to see from an ESG performance standard from the companies that you're investing in? Yeah, so we do invest later. I mean, we do take some small development risks, but the bulk of our portfolio tends to be um, either in construction or generally in production. Uh, and we have, you know, very detailed um, questionnaires, which we require of all potential investee companies, and then regular updates and open communication between the companies and ourselves as to whether they are facing any issues and how they plan to um, address those. And, uh, and it's very much an open dialogue, which we need to in turn report to our, our own shareholders that we are, you know, trying to pursue the highest standards of of, of governance. Um, obviously, we overlay that with our own internal, um, you know, carbon minimization activities and selection of jurisdictions to ensure that some of these risks are minimized uh, as well um, to the extent that we can control them. And Caroline, is Sprott taking a, a fairly similar view? And how, how influential are your um, investors in, in shaping that policy? Well, you know, this, as Julian has said, this is a this is a critical piece for anybody providing financing today. Um, you know, at Sprott, we are we're a member of the Responsible Investment Association. We've signed up to the UN principles, um, so you know that forms the backdrop of everything we do. In addition, you know, we we only want to back companies that are doing the right thing, that are going about things in the right fashion. And frankly, where we can see that there are benefits to the communities surrounding those projects. And, you know, as I say, that things are done well on the environmental side and on the governance side, you know, those are, those are critical factors for us. I think in the streaming and royalty space, we don't quite have as much say as someone like the IFC does, um, just given where we, where we sit in the overall structure. But nonetheless, whilst we're going into transactions, it's at that point in time where we have quite a lot of say as to what we what we insist on. Um, and, and we're pretty definitive about what it is we're looking for from the various companies. We you know, do our own internal due diligence. We'll have technical people look at the environmental side of things. We'll have lawyers look at the you know, environmental permits, et cetera. And on the social side, we'll also employ external consultants to go to wherever the project is, talk to the communities, talk to the politicians, make sure that we have a good view as to what is happening as far as the, as Roland termed it, the social license to operate. And that is, that for us is more of a critical piece, perhaps than some of the technical aspects. You know, the technical aspects are poured over by a number of parties, frankly, before it even gets to us. Whereas the social aspects, you know, sometimes the management teams look at this and go, well, we have, you know, we have two guys down there. You should be able to rely on that. And it's, you know, that, that unfortunately doesn't work for us. There are many instances in which, in which we seek third party independent verification of what the management teams are telling us. Yeah, the social side, and I'm sure John being an Australian and, and the, the latest controversies in uh, Australia around that, um, would agree with that. I, although I'm going to, I'm going to just ask a slightly different question, John, on the, on the, maybe from the low carbon kind of zero carbon. There's been a lot of stuff in the mining press recently about, you know, making sure your mine is uh, has very low carbon output, even kind of negative, if possible. Mm. Is is it important for you um, uh, when you're investing into a project to see as it develops that? power supplies, for example, are going to be renewable power supplies that they, people will be moving away from diesel. How important is that in the project development? Well, I think there's there's two different aspects to that. There's obviously the decarbonisation um, 
trend itself and Orion as a fund is is actively investing uh, in, in the energy transition space. We're, we're constantly looking for different ways to be exposed to that, uh, whether that's through, you know, obviously everyone wants to own copper at the moment, but there's we own copper all the way down to lithium. Um, I think that's one aspect of it, which Orion is, is heavily involved in, the energy transition and how we can be a part of that as a, as a mining and minerals investor. I think from the portfolio company level and, and, and the individual investment level, um, it has to be uh, it has to be practical. But what's what's I think very exciting for uh, for many of these companies, particularly in, in jurisdictions like Australia with a with a natural endowment, uh, is that you're seeing at the the, the capex level um, that renewables are starting to cross a threshold where where they are you know economically attractive alongside uh, backup gas power or, or, or grid power um, in its own right. So yes, I do think that's a, that's a live consideration for companies, but of course uh, it has to be an economic consideration for the company. And if you are uh, in the middle of Western Australia, very, very stranded and far away, and perhaps it's not sunny, um, then, then that's going to be, it's going to be a different type of consideration for you as a company. Uh, but no, it's very exciting. I think the, 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 the crossing point of, uh, of costs uh, is, is certainly happening. And there are, there are a number of um, government backed investors in Australia that are seeking to assist companies in, uh, in displacing uh, more, more carbon intense forms of power generation in their mining projects. Excellent, thanks. And, and anybody feel free to step in on, on this point. I, I was just going to ask, um, pick up something Roland, you said earlier when you mentioned green bonds, it's, which is another term I've seen yeah, in the last six months. Is there, I mean, can you maybe explain what, what are green bonds, green loans? Um, are they very different from the uh, other facilities that mining companies can look at? And generally, what are the terms of those loans um, and how do they uh, help invest uh, help uh, mining companies yeah so i mean it, building from your your previous question on uh, transitioning to a cleaner uh, energy i think we are just looking to be able to support uh, most of uh, the mining companies out there who are is essentially looking to um, uh, achieve some of the, the un uh, development goals you know whether it's the uh, the meteors or the the large mining companies. So in that sense, what we are what we think uh, would be helpful from our standpoint is to propose um, a, a term a, like a corporate loan term sheet. You know, usually we don't we are quite uh, flexible in terms of of amounts. We have rates that are quite uh, competitive, but we link them to tangible milestone on the ground, whereby companies are essentially committing, for example, to trans transitioning to uh, a cleaner source of energy, right? For example, we have a, a product line that we call uh, power, to, power to Mines, whereby we can actually provide, say, a corporate loan to a company. But in addition to that, our infrastructure team will come in there and work with the, the company to you know, maybe um, uh, implement a solar uh, energy uh, uh, source there, or maybe a renewable energy, maybe wind, whatever, you know, depending on where the project is located. So I think we, we are just trying to give uh, our clients a wide range of, of, of products beyond your traditional uh, project finance or uh, a corporate loan. Uh, that being said, there are certain restrictions. For example, if you take uh, what we call an SDG length loan, the use of proceeds, you know, we have to make sure that uh, uh, the proceeds are being utilized in a way that will enable those, uh, those companies to achieve or support some of the UN uh, development uh, goals. I mean, we can get into uh, uh, more detail. I don't think it's geared towards mining, uh, junior mining uh, companies. It's essentially more uh, project who are either at the, at the production stage or being uh, essentially being, uh, uh, being built. Uh, I'll stop there uh, and we can get into more details uh, later on. Um, maybe one, one for then Caroline or Julian. I mean, is there such a thing as a green royalty yet? As a, or is, is that it intrinsic anyway in your uh, offering? You know, I think for, for groups like, well, I'll talk about us and Julian can talk about his, where we look further afield and we're not solely looking at precious metals, 
I think straight away, you're almost drawn to the more battery metals green side of the business. You know, and I rather refer to it as battery metals than green, frankly, um, because we are looking at things like copper, John mentioned, and, um, you know, the more niche metals, tin, niobium, rare earths, you know, tungsten, kind of you name it. We are looking at those as part of building out our portfolio. What we found is that our investors are very interested in getting exposure to those types of metals. Um, and they're, you know, actively persuading us and suggesting that we do more of those types of transactions. So we have seen, you know, investors being more interested in the battery metals and, you know, we will go where the investors would like us to put the money. I mean, there is, there is that, um, you know, and we'll also do, you know, we also need to be able to deploy capital into, into assets, which we can see going forward. And given the, the big drive into electrification, battery metals, you know, the green economy, you name it, it's certainly our view that a lot more of these projects are going to come to fruition, um, which is what we need in order to make our returns work on the, on the back end. I think, I think from our perspective, whilst we also are interested in those metals, for the last couple of years, we've been looking also at the specifications of the individual commodities. So we're very interested and we have been pursuing the strategy of investing in purer um, forms of metals with less contaminants, less impurities. So I think um, over time, everybody historically relied upon, you know, the two dimensional cost curve. I think in the mining space, we're gonna break into a three dimensional um, carbon cost curve. And we've started to see some work being done on that. So, you know, we are looking at the source of um, energy for particular projects, the specifications, the grade, is very important because lower grade actually is more polluting. Um, so all of that, it's becoming much more um, sophisticated analysis in terms of what's attractive and what's going to get a premium in the new world compared to the past where everything was, you know, a commodity and treated very much on a commoditized basis. And is it is it right then to say that on that basis in the, the way things are looking, um, coal is now pretty much dead? Um, I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. Well, I think coal is dead uh, from a public markets perspective. I mean, I, I think certainly in the US and Europe, people think of coal as um, uh, sort of, yeah, something that's, obsolete like a dinosaur. I think in other parts of the world, it continues to be a major part of the energy mix. And obviously different types of coal have different applications and steel making coal continues to be um, difficult to replace, whereas energy coal has many different alternatives. So I think it is a complicated picture. I think many people think of coal, as you say, um, as something that's dead, but it's not dead. I think parts of it are very much alive. Uh, but it's in different parts of the world, um, but continues to be a major part of the global energy mix. I don't think anybody publicly is writing new streaming or royalty deals on coal assets um, in the same way that they're not really financing coal assets from Western banks. Uh, and if you want you know, that nowadays, you have to go to, I don't know, Russian banks or um, you know, banks in, in, in Asia um, so it has become a, a very much segmented part of the financing world, uh, the coal world. Yeah. Well, maybe um, given time, we'll move we'll move on to the next the next question, which um, unfortunately is unavo unavoidable in the current circumstances. But um, thinking about financing in the current kind of post COVID. Uh, environment we're, we're living in how are you managing to to do that how are you managing to carry out your due diligence do site visits etc is that is that slowing you down in your investment decisions um or have you found a way to work around that maybe we'll start with john given you're in australia which may be a difficult jurisdiction to do that internationally Yes, no, indeed, we are relatively restricted on uh, on our current due diligence travel. 
Um, but uh, look, I think I'm sure Julian and Roland and Carolyn will agree. I think everyone is finding ways to work around. Uh, we we actually closed our largest ever deal during COVID, um, so it, it's it's no restriction uh, to business. I think um, uh, remote site visits are increasingly the norm. Uh, there's obviously the ability to you know put put a camera on someone's head and send them around the site and, and actually perform interviews in that way. There are drones. Um, we also have a global relationship network of independent technical experts that we can send to site, uh, which increasingly we're doing. Um, and I think on from the company's perspective, it, what, what they can do and what the best companies are doing is being very, very organized with respect to data uh, and reports and data rooms. So the, the, the more effective that a company can be in terms of opening its books, uh, I think that the quicker and more streamlined that process can be. But no, I think it's uh, it's just an accepted reality. Uh, and I, I would imagine, you know, Roland, Julian and Carolyn would agree that uh, we're all ready to deploy money and do deals in this environment. So there are always workarounds. Yeah, I, you know, I would say that nothing beats a first-hand site visit. You know, that is hands down for me to go to site with our technical experts is hands down the, you know, the most preferred method of doing site visits. But I, I completely agree with John. There are workarounds, you know, we have trusted both technical and commercial experts in various parts of the world. So we would send a, you know, an ex-CEO with 30, 40 years experience alongside a technical team to go and take a look at an asset. Um, you know, and essentially provide the, the guidance from more of a commercial aspect. And I'm not saying that engineers aren't commercial, so, you know, don't, engineers don't beat me up, but to really look at it more from a transaction perspective than just a technical perspective. So we like to mix the, um, the skills and experience that go to site. And, you know, if that's not myself or it's not my partner, then it has to be somebody else who we trust who brings those same sorts of skills and experience. And you know, and we would we would go about it that way. Yeah. So I was just going to um, add that I fully agree with both John and and Caroline. I mean, these are obviously very challenging time for um, uh, both mining companies and and and, and banks. Uh, but we are finding ways to continue to support our clients. Virtual uh, appraisals. Uh, have been, you know, one way to to do that. In some cases, we've have been able to use in-country uh, staff uh, with uh, technical expert, external uh, consultant um, uh, joining. I think the toughest uh, part it's being able to um, or not being able to engage with communities on the social uh, side. Uh, in some cases, even when you have um, external consultants or in-country staff that you know, might be uh, willing to and able to do it, but there might still be some restrictions from the government uh, standpoint that would prevent you from uh, gauging, you know, for example, if there is uh, support um, on, on, on the community side uh, for the project, uh, et cetera. So it's slowing things down a little bit, but we are still trying, you know, pushing and making sure that uh, clients uh, I'm aware that we are we are open for business, and we're being you know trying to be as creative as we can without compromising uh, the due diligence aspect of of our work. You know, I'll stop there. Yeah, and I I just you know agree with with all of that. It is slower. You do have to rely much more on in country. Um, that's easier done on the technical side. On the ESG side, the consultants tend to be more global. Um, and so that is more problematic. Uh, but, um, you know, on the flip side, we're coming out of this uh, crisis with renewed appreciation of the virtues of the mining sector, of the importance of, you know, carbon reduction, of the shortages that we've seen um, in um, uh, creating new mines coming to fruition. And globally, you know, a great emphasis on infrastructure and greening investments, which should be good for our sector. So there are some silver linings to the difficulties we've been facing. I'd just add, actually, I think there's some really interesting points there from, from Roland and, uh, and, and Julian. I'd urge um, any of the companies sort of, sort of watching this that um, 
to appreciate the, the long lead times associated with um, uh, all of their ESG work. Uh, and as Julian says, uh, you know, that you've got to consider where your consultants are coming from. Um, these pieces of work take, take months and years. Um, so if you're looking for financing next year, uh, it's probably a live and present consideration how, how you manage uh, how you manage this border issue at the moment and getting the, the, the quality work that you need done. Thanks, John. That, that was really helpful input, I think, for the junior miners watching. And, and just staying with that topic on junior miners, I think our next issue was really to ask, um, given your kind of all slight, apart from Roland, possibly alternative finance providers, um, where is the value for you in the, the junior miners? Um, it seems to me, in certainly sitting in London, that um, Julian, you had a bit of a monopoly over the, the, the royalties game, the only listed group here, but now you are seeing some competition, I know, in different areas, but you know, Wheaton have come to London, etc. The royalties and streaming, is, is, which was traditionally very Canadian, um, has come to London. Uh, it, it, it's become more competitive. So where, where are you seeing the opportunities to, to help junior miners? Maybe start, Julian, with you and then move to Caroline. Well, I think, I mean, Wheaton is obviously a precious royalty player. And I think what we've seen in the last year with the price of gold and silver going up is much more um, open capital markets to equity financing for precious metals, which has meant that the uh, precious streamers of which there are many, and they, you know, there's probably a dozen or more now, um, have been seeing a lot of competition. So I think um, they've been seeing a lot of competition for um, precious streams. And then the um, companies haven't wanted to do as much streaming because they could just get equity cheaply from the capital market. So I think we've seen a definite decline in the volume of precious royalty deals conducted in the past couple of years. And a lot of those um, companies are somewhat growth constrained and we might well see uh, a bout of mergers um, as they try and get larger and become more relevant to index investors. Um, I think in the non-precious space, it continues to be a much less competitive area. Um, it's, it's much more global. There have been one or two smaller uh, players emerging who are jumping on the sort of battery metals bandwagon. Uh, but they're not um, significant in, in size um, yet. O obviously, we have seen as well private equity players with stapled financing like Orion or Appian doing royalty deals as well. So it is, it is evolving, but at the same time, it is becoming more mainstream and more accepted. I think, you know, when I started doing this many years ago, a lot of people didn't want to talk about royalties. Uh, or streams and felt that these were things that they shouldn't be considering. Now, I think it's very much seen as, uh, you know, part of the accepted financing mix and very much um, conventional. So um, it, is, it is an evolving market. There's continual new bells and whistles put on, on um, royalties and streams to make them uh, overall relevant. Uh, but the bottom line is we're in a sector which is hugely capital intensive. Uh, the banks are not there in the way that they used to be a long time ago. Um, a number of banks are still, um, you know, uh, less keen to invest and loan. So there's a constant role for us. And half of what we do actually is primary royalties. The other half is secondary royalties. So we know we don't talk about the secondhand market, but for those, you know, explorers um, who have ended up with a royalty on a, on a mine, you know, we're a very good place to go to monetize um, these things, which can become very valuable. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Caroline. I would, yeah, I, I agree with Julian. I think there's a, there's very much a, a portion of the streaming and royalty market, which is, you know, absorbed by the large players who are looking to deploy large amounts of money, you know, a hundred, $200 million per deal, they're willing to price these things on a 50 year basis because they are looking as a listed vehicle to create royalties and streams which are going to last that period of time. I think the differentiation between say a group like ours and those listed companies 
is that, you know, we have long patient capital, but we're not looking to do something for the next 50 years. Um, I don't plan on still being chatting to you in the next 50 years, Charles, as pleasant as this is. So, Same. you know, our timeframes are, time are somewhat different, number one. And, you know, our size that we're targeting is between 10 and 50, five zero million dollars. So we sit in a different bracket to those very large streaming companies. Um, Julian mentioned the plethora of small royalty companies that have started up recently. They're doing half a million dollars, one million dollar deals. So, you know, we're not playing in that space either. And what we've seen over the, over the past year that the fund's been in existence is there is almost a, I don't want to say a dearth of capital, but there's not very much capital that's focused on that middle section where we are, and that is willing to do both primary and, as Julian called them, the second-hand royalties. I do like that phrase. Um, and, and we will do both. We will provide primary funding for companies that are looking to do a bankable feasibility study or take assets through to con through construction into production. We recently did an acquisition financing for a, a company that wanted to buy a reasonably small scale mine and grow that over time. And then we've also done, you know, secondary royalty acquisitions. So, you know, we can do a, a combination, but I think that probably the two main differentiating factors of what we do from everyone else is that we have capital to, de to deploy and we want to actually get that money into mining companies' hands. Um, and then we're looking in a certain size bracket. Yeah. And, and John, I mean, Orion, it strike me, but tell me if I'm wrong, it's more as a kind of structured finance house in that royalties, you can, you can deploy those and as, as and when you need them. I know recently we, we were acting with you guys on a what, what was called a production financing agreement was actually a royalty at the end of the day, but you will use them in the overall scenario, the whole financing package. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. Um, so uh, Orion has two two main funds, two separate funds and, and two very different strategies. The one I think you're talking about is historically Orion Mine Finance, which is, has done its best work, as I think I mentioned earlier, in large single ticket cross capital financings, which will often include a stream or a royalty, uh, as well as debt and as well as equity. And in that space, you know, we continue to be very active. It's our largest fund. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of opportunity in consolidations and carve outs. Uh, we just recently closed a deal with Equinox and Premier uh, on, on the hard rock mine, which was a nice complicated transaction to work on. And in that space, the gold sector, as I think we'll all be, a, be agreed on, is very, very healthy. Uh, and, and base metals has got some catching up to do and we're actively seeking uh, base metal opportunities. But this, the second side of our business and, and, and the second uh, fund uh, is Orion Mineral Royalties Fund. Um, so this is, a, this is a pure mineral royalties fund um, that, well, that, that, that can take different types of structures within that, but that's its focus. And that's for non-base and precious. Uh, and, and that side of the business is, is incredibly active. Um, we're seeing huge amount of investor demand and also we're seeing a huge amount of opportunity. Indeed, we've, we've recently uh, co-invested with Julian on a, on a, on a transaction in this fund. Uh, and that fund will look at anything from uh, you know, potash to battery metals to, to downstream opportunities. Um, and, and I think that's a really exciting uh, part of the market to be in at, at this stage. I think, as, as Julian may have mentioned, that there's an enormous amount of opportunity uh, outside of the, the traditional uh, uh, base and precious metal sectors. So that's what Orion's focused on, um, the, those kind of two strategies, one team, two strategies, I would guess I would, um, I would describe it as. Roland, we, um, from the IFC's perspective, do you offer any sort of streaming or royalty financing, or is it really just the, the more, I shouldn't call it vanilla, because it's still very important, but the, the more, the more um, normal debt solutions? The yeah, the, the, the latter. We have not actually been active in royalty or, or streaming uh, uh, business. You know, it's the bulk of our work. It's primarily, you know, project finance, uh, some equity. Um, yeah, but uh, no, no streaming or, or royalty okay. at this point. Um, I guess um, maybe we should, we just, just sticking with the royalty and, uh, and streaming, maybe a couple of you could just explain to, for the juniors, who are listening in why um, they should 
think about a streaming or a royalty D, uh, a royalty um, financing and why that may be better from some of the other sources of financing at a junior stage. I'd be quite interested in that, I think. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to go first um, if you'd like, Charles. I mean, I think, I, I think royalties and streams are wonderful things. I mean, I think they're wonderful inventions. They give people so much flexibility uh, on the on the one hand, um, you don't have to uh, deal with new shareholders and the dilution if you believe in your project, because once we've made an investment uh, as a streamer or a royalty company, um, our, our involvement in the business is very limited um, and we have very little say, which is why, as Caroline said, um, you know, from an ESG perspective, we have the greatest influence just before we invest. Once the uh, companies have our capital, uh, we really, to a large extent, hope for the best, although there are obviously governance um, uh, aspects to it. And then, um, you know, a royalty, unlike debt, um, doesn't require repayment in the same way. Uh, we are taking an equity risk on the business producing, uh, on the business um, selling its product alongside the shareholders, although we don't have any votes as shareholders uh, in general. Um, and, um, and therefore, I think it's a sort of hybrid instrument which combines a lot of flexibility uh, for the counterparties, uh, which where we are taking equity risk, but we're not having all the rights of equity shareholders. And I think if you really believe in your project, um, you know, uh, I think it's a wonderful way to help finance. And the costs of the royalties are actually often much, much lower than equivalent bank finance, particularly when you add on all the fees that banks are charging these days. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Julian. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd, I think I'd echo, I'd echo that from Julian. Certainly on the, on the cost side, I, I would urge uh, companies to, to, to try and fully understand their own cost of capital and particularly the, the cost of equity uh, and, and realize that, that certainly, you know, from Orion's perspective, um, the, 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 uh, the mineral royalties fund offering uh, and indeed the, the main fund offering, uh, and I'm sure the same is true for, for Caroline Rowland and Julian, all of these products are designed to be accretive to the cost of equity uh, and they're designed to sit uh, comfortably within uh, within bank finance, within uh, within equity offerings, uh, and they really are uh, accretive and, and, and attractive to, to to these businesses and companies, rather than uh, uh, you know traditionally raising uh, quite a lot of equity and diluting shareholders. So I, I would urge companies to to fully understand that and, and understand the benefit that they offer. Yeah, you know, maybe Caroline. One of the um, things I sometimes hear mining companies say: we don't want a royalty you know, that's going to, to um, be disruptive to the valuation of the company going forward. You know, we might have this large royalty hanging over us for many years. What, what's the response to that type of argument? You know, I think, Charles, all that is, all that depends on the actual size of the royalty. I think royalties less so, but certainly streams a few years back got a really bad name. You know, we saw some spectacular failures where, one company was streaming 30% of the gold coming out of one project. And obviously that is unsustainable. You know, what we've seen over the last call it five to 10 years has been that the stream quantities have certainly reduced dramatically more in line with where you would expect a royalty to be. So these are not massive drags and frankly in our business should not be massive drags on the project economics. Anyone looking to buy that project in the future would assess it with the royalty. And, you know, for a group like, like us at Sprott, we are always open to having a discussion if somebody wanted to buy back their royalty. Because, as I said earlier, we're not in this business to create 50-year royalties. So, you know, for, for us, we, we do feel sometimes that streams have got a bad name. Um, we, use them, we use the terms interchangeably. There are differences, obviously. But for, you know, for us, we look at it all from a financial perspective. And sometimes with a royalty, the company might land up paying withholding tax if there's a cross-border 
um, cash flow attached to the royalty. With a stream, it might not actually attract that same withholding tax. So, you know, it may be more efficient for a company to do a stream rather than a royalty. And we can show companies how the maths works either way. You know, you, you balance the two out. It's not as though a firm like ours would be making more on the stream than we would on the royalty because we're not a trader. So it's not like we're bringing the precious, you know, the, the metal itself, the physical metal into a big trading book and making trading margins on it. So, you know, we do view these things from a financial perspective and we try and put in place, you know, one which is more efficient than, than the other. Okay, I think we're, um, we've got a bit more time, but maybe just move on to the last topic, um, which is really just, um, I guess, a shift in the commodity environment. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think we're all pretty thankful that we seem to be moving upwards with commodity prices, um, gold, iron ore, um, lithium even, you know, seem to, be, seem to be doing well at the moment. Does that mean um, that there is going to be more money available from from lenders um, in this type of environment, and um, maybe maybe Roland, we can start with you. Yeah, no, um, thanks, um, Charles. I wanted to make a quick comment on the the previous uh, discussion quickly, if, if you don't no, mind. Please, I think th thanks very much. I think for uh, uh, companies that have a relatively advanced. Uh, project C, pre-feasibility or feasibility study uh, stage project, I think we'll like to think of ourselves are not just providing um, financing options for those companies. Obviously, in addition to, um, you know, to the money, we'll like to be able to support our clients with things like environmental and social issues. And also, we have um, uh, what we call our advisory services uh, team that have expertise in helping a uh, clan uh, ultimately achieve the social license to operate, whether it's initiatives with uh, uh, local communities in terms of, you know, local content or uh, local supplier development uh, programs, youth and, and women uh, employment, things that are, you know, quite important and will um, lay the ground for uh, achieving, uh, I think, uh, a good relationship between the mining companies um, and, uh, and and communities. So we, you know, we like to think else, to think of ourselves as you know coming in, but having a whole range of uh, expertise beyond just the, the financial uh, value add that obviously is, is critical. But being able to help companies with uh, achieve uh, good industry practice in terms of ENS, and also having concrete initiatives on the ground to uh, ultimately have a good relationship with, uh, uh, you know, with, with local communities. Uh, I just wanted to get that out there. Yeah, no, in I, terms think, I think that's a fair point is that you offer more than just money. Uh, you, offer, you do offer that. And I've had clients who have said, look, let's talk to the IFC because it will give us some governmental protection. It's more it's, uh, in, 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 let's put it this way, in, in, in more risky countries, if you've got the IFC standing behind you, it's less likely the government are going to um, give you a, a tough time. Uh, absolutely, it's just by virtue of being a part of the World Bank group, you know, we can usually help with political risk uh, mitigation, which as you noted in some jurisdiction can be quite, uh, quite key. Um, yeah. In terms of your last, uh, sorry, what was the last question again? So the, last, the last question is in a rising, yeah commodity price market, is uh, there going to be more uh, financing options available for the juniors? Sure, yeah, yeah, there's no question about it. But I think, you know, we continue to be quite, um, quite selective. I mean, in the past, we have done a number of investment with junior mining uh, companies. Uh, we have slightly moved, or our strategy has slightly evolved, whereby we like to come in uh, on a bit of a, a you know a le uh, later stage, as I noted, you know, with a pre-feasibility study or a feasibility study, to help finance those projects through constructions and into uh, into uh, production. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, in a rising commodity market, there will certainly be opportunities for junior mining companies uh, to raise money. Uh, but if you're thinking long term, I think the IFC could be a good uh, a good option because we can come in 
early and provide uh, uh, equity to help those companies with uh, advanced studies, whether it's an ESA or a feasibility study. And then, you know, when the permitting is, is fully uh, completed and debt financing is needed, we can subsequently provide uh, uh, th that debt financing. So there are a number of options depending on each client's unique uh, situation that we can, but the key is always being able to come in at an earlier stage with a sizable uh, project and with uh, environmental and social issues that could be, uh, you know, managed uh, adequately and so that we can, you know, we can help our clients be, be successful. Uh, I'll stop there. Okay. John, how, how's it looking for you? Is the future looking rosy? Uh, I would say that, uh, no, there's, there's certainly, uh, it's a bright, uh, it's a bright future for, for the metals markets. I think that the um, institutional investor appetite is, is somewhat returning, um, but I think there's some way to go. Uh, there have been a lot of, um, certainly in the banking side, uh, there have been a huge amount of withdrawals and, and teams removed. Um, company, you know, banks getting out of certain product lines and sectors. Uh, I, I don't think that will change soon. Um, uh, and I think that does give an opportunity for everyone here uh, to, to, to deploy their capital uh, and try and solve the issues that that faces. Um, but certainly, I think from a, from a, a pure price and an equity markets and uh, institutional allocations perspective, um, it's, it's definitely far more positive than it has been, uh, you know, say five years ago. So the, pleased about the direction of travel. And I think everyone should be excited about what that holds. Caroline? Yeah, I am just thrilled that commodity prices are running. Yeah, I, I remember meeting with Julian sort of February, March last year, and things were looking pretty dire. And now here we are, and prices are back up. You know, copper was at $2.20. It's now at $3.60. Like, this is fantastic. You know, I think for those of us that provide financing, high prices is always better than low, but we shouldn't forget that low prices come back because the business is cyclical. I think the challenge now, Charles, will be to make sure that we all don't fall into the same trap of financing the more rubbish projects, because the more rubbish projects tend to come back when prices run. So, you know, I think fortunately, a number of us on this panel have been around the market long enough that we've seen these things a few times. And I think that's going to be that's going to be the key is whilst the prices look like they're on an upward trend, it's to make sure that we're choosing projects which are actually able to survive through the cycle. Mm -hmm. and just to build on that from Carolyn, prices may be rising, but but grades are still falling. So <laughs> the, the technical issues are, are are increasing. If anything, as as uh, in particularly in the gold space, you see uh, the number of companies trying to develop. You know, under a gram a ton, um, those technical issues become more and more acute uh, as that as that occurs. So, so it's not just price. Uh, we all have to be aware of uh, of the technical issues as well. And cost. Uh, huh? um, yes. Um, Please. I mean, I, yeah, I, I think I think it's true. We've we've taken the pain. So this time. For some gain, but it is, you know, a supply demand balance. And we're coming off a situation where the supply of finance was very low uh, and demand is going up for finance. Supply will go up too. And the question is, is that going to be unbalanced or not? What I can say is, in addition to the grade decline, the period for new mines to get approved continues to become longer and longer. Um, and it's now, I don't know, 20 or 25 years from discovery to the time that something comes into production uh, in many cases. So the uh, supply elasticity of the sector is going down uh, together with the grade decline. And I think that should mean that you're going to get more extreme cycles uh, going forward than we've been seeing in the past, both on the upside and the downside. So hopefully we have some time to run. Uh, but as Caroline says, um, you know, prices go down as well as up. Uh, but it, it, it is it is a slightly different environment to the ones we've seen in the past. And what's interesting about the world at the moment is for, for the first time in ages, 
you potentially have, you know, um, uh, stimulus in the US, Europe and China happening at the same time and that we haven't seen for for a long, long period. Roland, did you want to add to that? No, no, no. I was actually trying to build on the, on John's last point in terms of being cautious and somewhat selective. Uh, ultimately, even in a rising uh, pricing environment, you know, you still want to stick with low cost uh, uh, operations. That's all, you know, low cash costs so that when price fall, you know, those miners are still relatively competitive. Yeah. OK, well, I think we've probably reached the end of our allotted time. So we should say thank you um, to all of all of you for joining, uh, Roland, John, Caroline and Julian. And uh, we hope that those watching the junior miners uh, have enjoyed this and obviously get in touch with the people involved uh, if you need finance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much.